So tonight, tonight I'm going to talk about four promises of Jesus Christ. Four promises. Now Jesus Christ has promised many, many things. But tonight I want to focus on four promises that I think are very, very critical for our relationship. You know, many people say, well, you got to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ or you got to uh, uh, surrender yourself to the Lord. And, and, and a lot of people make or say different things that you, in order to have this relationship, you know, with Jesus Christ, to have a personal relationship, to surrender yourself to Him, and so on and so forth. The thing is, is that when Jesus Christ came down to earth, He simply asked us a few things. And when He asked us these few things, He promised that He would take care of us. If all we did was follow or learn or accept or receive or participate in these few things. I'm going to ask you to go to John chapter 6 with me. John chapter 6 is a very, very powerful chapter. You know, when many people talk about communion or Holy Communion or, um, you know, Holy Eucharist or receiving Jesus Christ or, you know, eating Jesus Christ's body, blood, soul, and divinity, this John chapter 6 is really, really awesome because we as Christians, we as believers in Jesus Christ, we're told by Jesus Christ Himself certain things to do and to follow in order for us to have a happy life. Now many people might want to distort this or change this or present a different way, but the key thing is, is that whatever is spoken here tonight, we're going to allow the Holy Spirit that dwells in each and every one of us to be that comforter, to be that spiritual guide for each and every one of us. I'm going to read from uh, John chapter 6. Remember, when you, when you read from, when you go back and you read John chapter 6 as a whole, what happens here is that Jesus Christ shows them a couple of pretty powerful, uh, excuse me, uh, miracles before he starts talking to them about the multiplication of the loaves. So here at the multiplication of the loaves in John chapter 6, verse 1, I'm going to read just for a few verses. It says, <clears throat> After this, Jesus went across the Sea of Galilee of Tiberias. A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs he was performing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. The Jewish feast of Passover was near. When Jesus raised his eyes and saw that a large crowd was coming to him, he said to Philip, Where can we buy enough food for them to eat? He said this to test them, because he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered, 200 days wages worth of food would not be enough for each of them to have a little bit. One of his disciples, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what good are these for so many? Jesus said, Have the people recline. Now there was a great deal of grass in that place. So the men reclined, about 5,000 in number. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to, those, to them to those who were reclining, and also as much as the fish as they wanted. When they had had their fill, he said to his disciples, Gather the fragments left over so that nothing will be wasted. So they collected the fragments that were left over and it filled 12 wicker baskets with the fragments from the five barley loaves that had been more than they could eat. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, Truly, this is a prophet, the one who is to come into the world. Since Jesus knew that they were going to come and carry him off and make him a king, he withdrew again to the mountain alone. Then it goes to verse 16, walking on the water. When it was evening, his disciples went down to the sea, embarked in a boat, and went across the sea to Capernaum. It had already grown dark, and Jesus had not come yet come to them. The sea was stirred up because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they began to be afraid. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. They wanted to take him into the boat. But the boat immediately arrived at the, shore, at the shore to which they were heading. So before we you know, continue on reading, we hear about this first miracle here. Uh, or actually two miracles. One is the multiplication of the loaves. How many people does it say that they fed? 
5,000. 5,000, right? Not counting women or children. So here's just this big, miraculous miracle that Jesus Christ just fed over 5,000 people with a few loaves of bread and a few fish, okay? Over 5,000 people, and yet there were still wicker baskets that they picked up and they filled them up, and the people had their fill, they didn't even want anymore. So that was one big, big miracle as we come into this John chapter 6. The second one is they see Jesus Christ walking on the water, right? So two big, great miracles. And the reason why we're showing these miracles is because as we're walking down this journey, okay, as we're, as we're coming to this place of the, of the multiplication of the loaves and we get to this place of walking on the water, we're coming closer to what Jesus Christ is telling all of humanity, all of mankind, about receiving Him body, blood, soul, and divinity, okay? So here in verse 22 it says, The next day the crowd that remained across the sea saw that there had only been one boat there, and that Jesus had not gone along with His disciples in the boat, but only His disciples had left. Other boats came from Tiberias near the place where they had eaten the bread, when the Lord gave thanks. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into boats and came to Capernaum looking for Jesus. And when they found him across the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered them and said, Amen, amen, I say to you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life. So basically, Jesus Christ says, you're not looking for me for these particular reasons. You're looking for me because you guys ate and you were filled, no? If we go back and read that, uh, verse 26, he says, Jesus answered them and said, Amen, amen, I say to you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not work for food that perishes but for the food that endures for eternal life. So not just for the temporary uh, fulfillment or the temporary uh, refreshment or the temporary feeling, but look for that thing that's going to fulfill for all eternity, which is Jesus Christ. He says, which the Son of Man will give you, which he says, I will give you. He says, for on him the Father God has set his seal, so they said to him, What can we do to accomplish the works of God? Jesus answered them and said, This is the work of God, that you believe in the one he sent. So they said to him, What kind what sign can you what sign can you do that we may see and believe in you? What can you do? So let's just stop there for a minute. Can you imagine that Jesus Christ just performed these two great, great miracles? First of all, he just got a few loaves of bread and a few fishes, and he just fed over 5,000 people. And yet, the people are still telling him, what can you do? What kind of sign can you give us? You can imagine the people back then that almost nothing that Jesus Christ could do would lead those people to turn to him. No? And that, that's the same way it is this day and age. This day and age is very, very similar because... Many people really are always asking Jesus, well, show me something that I can truly see, visually touch, or otherwise, otherwise I'm not going to believe it. Just like as we get to the end of the story, many people in this day and age are in this story here. He goes on to say, Our ancestors ate man in the desert as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Verse 32, so Jesus said to them, Amen, Amen, I say to you, It was not Moses who gave the bread from heaven. My Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So everybody knows that Jesus Christ is the bread from heaven. Everybody knows that Jesus Christ is the one that came down from heaven. Remember John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word is with God, the Word was God. All things came to be through Him, and without Him nothing came to be. And then verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. No? So when Jesus Christ says, 
For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So that is Jesus Christ. Not only that He came down, but He also gives life to all the world. Now many people take this for granted. I was talking to a person the other day, and this person was saying a number of things. But one of the things that uh, this person was saying is, well, you know, it doesn't matter about nothing in life. It doesn't matter about the sacraments that you guys call sacraments and so on and so forth. All our sins are forgiven yesterday, today, and in the future. And then I looked at this person and said, how can your sins and my sins possibly, could possibly be forgiven yesterday, today, and tomorrow? And, and this person says, because Jesus Christ already gave us everything. We don't have to do anything. We don't have to accept anything. We don't have to work on anything. We don't have to do anything in life because Jesus Christ already did everything for us. The reason why I bring up that topic is because when you come back over here, Jesus Christ is telling him something. He says in verse 32, Amen, amen, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. My Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. But I told you that although you have seen me, you do not believe. And if you go back to verse 29, it says, Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in the one that he sent. So the Father has sent Jesus Christ down to earth to redeem mankind. We can all agree with that. The Heavenly Father sent Jesus Christ down to earth to die on the cross for the sins of all humanity. We can agree with all that. But the story continues with Jesus Christ saying, you must do certain things. You must participate in certain things. You must do certain things. You must reflect on certain things. You've got to participate. You have to be involved. Huh? Not contrary to what this person says. and says, you don't have to do nothing. Well, this, is, this scripture here really separates a lot of people, including this person that I spoke to. Because after about an hour speaking to this person regarding John chapter 6, that person closed their own book and didn't want to read it no more because this person saw that Jesus Christ requires us to do more. Every single day, we're required to do something for the Lord. You know, each and every one of us was giving life. Uh, was blessed with every you know so many things here on earth but the thing is that the Lord wants something from us every single day every single day we're not here just to kick back and relax and do nothing you keep on reading here it says in verse uh, 36 but I told you that although you have seen me you do not believe everything that the Father gives me will come to me and I will not reject anyone who comes to me, because I came from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. And this is the one, will of the one who sent me, that I should not lose anything of what he gave me, but that I should raise it on the last day. For this is the will of the Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have eternal life, and I shall raise him on the last day. The Jews murmured about him because he says, I am the bread of life, that came down from heaven, and they said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? Do we not know his father and mother? Then how can he say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered and said to them, Stop murmuring among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draw him, and I will raise him on the last day. It is written in the prophets, They shall all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to my Father and learns from him comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Amen, amen, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the desert, but they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever and the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. 
You know, when you stop and you reflect on Mass, and anybody that goes to Mass, they go every Sunday, every other Sunday, whatever, whatever, you know, they can go every single day. But what people don't realize is when a person goes to Mass, they don't go for the readings alone. They don't go for the music alone. They don't go for the homily alone or, or for the uh, communion alone. They have to go for all of it, all combined in the whole entire Mass. If a person were to ask you, why do you go to Mass on Sundays, what would your answer be? Anybody. What would your answer be if a person off the street asked you, why do you go to Mass? What would your answer be? It's your obligation. Okay, so for Johnny, it's his obligation. To the Lord, you know, to get you Eucharist. Obligation to the Lord. To get you Eucharist. To get to Jesus. Worship the Lord. To worship. So obligation and worship. Anybody else? That's where we're taught. Receive the Holy Spirit. So, after everybody leaves this room tonight, I hope and I pray that those are in this room, those outside this room, those listening, watching, hearing, or whatever it might be, will remember these four promises. So the next time anybody asks you, why do you go to Mass? You can tell them about these promises that Jesus Christ promised every single person, every human being on the face of the earth that goes to church, that goes to Mass, can receive these promises. Four awesome and beautiful promises. You know, if you go back with me over here, back to uh, verse 46. And it says, not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Amen, amen, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the desert, but they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. The Jews quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. How many of us are alive right now? We believe we're alive, huh? We believe that we're breathing, that we're, we can talk, we can see, we can hear. So we believe that we're alive, huh? But Jesus Christ just told us something very, very critical here. He says, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you do not have life within you. So... Can we be alive without Jesus? No. Can we be awake without Jesus? Can we have a relationship without Jesus? Can we have a, uh, an encounter with Jesus without receiving Him? All we can do is just exist without Jesus. You know, that's how critical this teaching is, is because I don't want to just exist. I want to have life. You know, I remember a long time ago when I did this teaching, a lot of us, we drink coffee, coffee in the morning because we want energy, we want life, no? We drink protein drinks, we go swimming, we go jogging, uh, whatever it is that we do in our lives to make us feel alive, no? Every single person on the face of the earth does something to feel alive, no? Whether it's rolling down your window to get the cold air so you can feel alive, you can feel awake, whatever it is, we look for all these other remedies in life
to feel alive. But Jesus Christ says, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no life within you. Zero life within us, okay? Second, so he goes on to say in verse 54, he says, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him on the last day. So Jesus Christ says that we will have eternal life and that he will raise us on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me and I have life because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Unlike your ancestors who ate and still died, whoever eats this bread will live forever. So let's stop and look at this. You know, if you guys have never read this before, if you have never really thought about it before, look what happens when you go to communion and when you, you truly believe. First of all, you've got to truly, truly believe that when you go out for communion that you're truly eating the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. Not a piece of wafer, not a piece of bread, not a host, not a round, anything, but... You, first of all, have to truly believe that you are eating the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. And if you truly believe that, then you can receive these promises. But if you don't believe that, you're not going to receive these promises. Let's hold that page and go back one book to Luke. Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. For those of you who have not gone over a teaching similar to this regarding communion or the promises of Jesus Christ, this is Jesus Christ at the Last Supper. And this is what he says in Luke chapter 22, page 137, uh, verse 14. This is called the Last Supper. <clears throat> it says, When the hour came, he took his place at table with the apostles, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I shall not eat it again until there is fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Then Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, the Redeemer of, of all mankind, that people want to have a relationship with, that people want to say, you know, confess Him as your Lord and Savior, He took a cup, gave thanks, and said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I tell you that from this time on I shall not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took the bread, he said the blessing, and he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which will be given for you. Do this in memory of me. Do this in memory of me, not as a memory, but in memory of me. And likewise, the cup after that he is saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which will be shed for you. So here, Jesus Christ himself, black and white, speaks to all humanity. Okay, and he got, he's gathered around his twelve apostles, all the apostles that were there at this time. And he says, he grabs the bread in his hand, and he tells his apostles, This is my body. Take and eat of it. So the apostles, that's when you see the last... Supper pictures, you know, you see Jesus gathered around with all his apostles and they're breaking bread. When he's breaking that bread, Jesus Christ is speaking and he's saying, This is my body. Do this in memory of me, not as a memory. This is not a symbol. This is not, uh, you know, something to, to always remember what I did. He says, This is my body. Do this in memory of me. So he's telling the apostles, the early church, you do this in memory of me. So whenever you guys read this and you guys hear Jesus Christ speaking and he's saying, this is my body, which we give him for you. Do this in memory of me. Every time that you go to Mass, every time that you go to Communion, every time that you're walking up and you're chewing gum and you're cleaning your teeth and you're doing all these things, think about what you're doing. Think about whenever you're walking up 
the aisle, you're thinking about the football game, or the guy that's wearing that jersey, or this jersey, or you're checking out the person in front of you, or waving to the other people across the thing. Think about what you're doing at that time, because that is the time when you're walking and you're approaching Jesus Christ Himself in the host, in the bread, and you're saying, that's why when we all walk up, they say, body of Christ, we say, amen, right? We say, amen. When you say, amen, you're saying, yes, I believe that is the body of Christ. Amen. And then you take it and you consume it and you go back to your seat and you do whatever you do. Stop and reflect on that from now on because what you're doing is you are partaking in Jesus Christ Himself. Body, blood, soul, and divinity. I've always said this is going to be the most intimate, intimate encounter you'll have with anybody. For a person to consume another person, for a person to consume a piece of their own God, their Savior, their Redeemer, the Savior of all the world, for you to consume Him, you better have a clean mind, a clean thoughts, and not thinking about all this other stuff when you're growing up and you're doing that. That's why it's so important that these promises, see, a lot of people don't ever think about Mass this way. A lot of people think, well, you know, man, that, that, that priest was, uh, was long-winded, or that priest was boring. We forget what we're there for. This is the reason why the early church, you know, has people gathering in Mass, in the congregation as body of believers, to receive Jesus Christ's body, blood, soul, and divinity. The music is a bonus. The attire is a bonus. The people there are a bonus. All this is a bonus, but what's, what's, what's truly the whole thing is that you're going to receive those promises of Jesus Christ. That's why it's important to know about this Luke chapter 22. Let's go forward with me. Keep John 6, Mark, but let's go forward real quick to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. One Corinthians chapter ten, and it, that's on page two fifty five. Two fifty five. We have to understand not just the promises, because I don't want you guys to walk out. Yay! You know, let's focus on these four promises. I want you to focus on the whole story, especially like my son and my daughter. They're altar servers. They have to understand that what they're doing around that altar is not just helping out the priest not just helping out the deacon, but they're participating in something that has been going on for over 2,000 years, that as they're participating, they're taking up the wine, and they're taking up the, the, the chalice, and they're taking everything up. They're actually, these altar servers are actually putting the mass together for us. They're actually helping out the, the priest and the deacon uh, put this whole service together, no? How many of you guys grew up here at St. Anne's? So do you guys remember that around the altar there was some writing around the four, uh, uh, the four parts of the altar? Do you guys remember what that writing was? All these years, no? Uh, so in other words, in the middle of the altar there's a big old circle and it has a... Uh, uh, so what are they? What do they, they represent? This is why it's so important, you guys, to see your surroundings. Not looking about who's going to church and what they're dressed like and what they're wearing. No. Look at your surroundings when you go to Mass because the Mass is, is such a beautiful thing that we should actually focus on what's surrounding us. So over here in 1 Corinthians verse 14, 1 Corinthians 10, 14. It says, warning against idolatry. Therefore, my beloved, avoid idolatry. I am speaking as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I am saying. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because a loaf of bread is one, we though many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. So listen to what St. Paul is telling the, the Corinthians, okay? He says, he says, the cup of blessing that we bless, 
Is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? So when we're getting together and we're participating in this Mass, and we're participating in the body and the blood, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not the participation in the body of Christ? That's what was written around that altar on those four sides. This is exactly what was written out there that many people never realized what was right above their head all these years. You know, now they're torn down, you'll never see them again. The writings are gone. The scripture, that was a scripture that was surrounding the whole altar and it said, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? So it's not just what was written across around the altar. Listen to what the scripture says. Even St. Paul says, well, anytime you participate in the body and blood of Jesus Christ, you're participating in in the blood and the body. Not a symbolic thing, not something just to remember him by, but you're participating in his body, in his blood. This is what St. Paul is telling them. Now let's flip one more page forward and let's go to 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. So here in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, this is what it says. Then again, this is St. Paul speaking. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you. So where did St. Paul receive this message from? Lord. Not from the Bible. The Bible wasn't even around at this time. So he received this from the Lord, and he says, I also handed on to you that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was handed over, he took bread, and after he had given thanks, broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So here is St. Paul telling the Corinthians later on, that this is what Jesus Christ spoke, and this is what Jesus Christ said, and He's telling for all people to follow this. He says, This is my body. What would you guys say if I told you guys that it really wasn't His body, it's just a, it's just, um, a different way of putting the words? Would you guys believe me that, that, and say it's okay for me to correct this, or do you believe what the words are saying? Been saying the Bible says true. Okay, so it says it for self, right? I can't change it, right? Yeah. So this is what it says. It says, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Do this as often. Do this as often. As you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until He comes. So as often as you go to Mass, as often as you go to church, as often as you go to communion, as often as you receive Him, you're proclaiming the death of Jesus Christ. You're, you're proclaiming the, the life. You're, you're, you're proclaiming the risen Jesus. And every time that you go, you're proclaiming Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He says... Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily will have to answer for the body and blood of the Lord. Wow. So, growing up, we were always taught and told, like Johnny said earlier, we were taught this. We were taught that we need to go to confession before you go to communion, right? That you have to be cleansed of your sins. That you have to be clean. And the reason why is because when Jesus Christ goes into that temple, He doesn't want a defiled temple. He wants a clean temple. No? He wants to dwell inside this dwelling in a good, clean place because that's God Almighty, right? So, this is again what the Scripture says. It says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily, 
will have to answer for the body and blood of the Lord. We will have to answer for that, guys. It says a person should examine himself, and so eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. You cannot be judged for a symbol or say anything that's symbolic, only if it's real and true. And Jesus Christ is real and true, and the body and blood of Jesus Christ is real and true, and the Holy Communion is truly Jesus Christ's body, soul, and divinity. And that's why he says that a person should examine himself, and so eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are ill and infirm, and a considerable number are dying. This is so awesome to see this, you guys. Because when we go to Mass, when we go to Mass and we receive Jesus Christ's body, blood, soul, and divinity, we got to remember that it's truly Him. It's not just a reminder, it's not just a symbol, but it's truly Him. Truly, truly, truly our Lord, our God, our Savior, our Redeemer, because He said so. When He says, this is my body, we believe Jesus Christ because He is Almighty. So when He says that's His body, that's what He says, that's His body. We have to treat it as His body. We have to respect it as His body. We have to respect and treat Him as we would our true and only Savior and Redeemer, Jesus Christ. And that's why it's so important to see Luke chapter 22. It's so important to see 1 Corinthians 10. It's so important to see 1 Corinthians 11 because what the, the Scriptures tell us, what the early church tells us is that if we are not cleansed, if we are not clean, if we are not examining ourselves, or examining our lives, then we should not partake in this. That we should not be going to communion. It's so important for us to see this, you guys. That's why if you go back with me to John chapter 6, and Jesus Christ says, If you truly want life within you, eat my body, drink my blood. Now you got to remember that he's talking to these people back over 2,000 years ago. They just seen him multiply the loaves, feeding 5,000 people with a few fish and a few pieces of bread. They've just seen him walking in water. They've seen him raise the dead. They've seen him cure the, the, the paralyzed. They've seen him give people the ability to walk again, to talk again, to hear again, to speak again. All these people have seen Jesus Christ do all these miracles. When you get to John chapter 6, we've already read Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John is just finishing up everything here. So we know that all these people, when you actually read it, when you truly read it, these people are coming from different towns and different villages just to hear what Jesus Christ had to say, just to see Jesus, to touch Him, to touch His clothing, to be with the apostles, to be with the early church. All these people, they didn't have cars, they didn't have trucks. They had to walk, they had to go by boat, they had to swim. Whatever they had to do to get there, these people all did this just so that, yeah, that Jesus can be with them, to teach them, to heal them. Two weeks ago we talked about people were taking him to Jesus. They were making holes in the roof just to drop him down just so that Jesus can touch him and, and, and heal him. You know, people were, were, were carrying these people and, and doing all these, these very strong things in order to get a person to even get near to Jesus. And this scripture right here changed everything for them. They changed everything for all humanity. And even this day and age, Christians have always been on a straight road. When you get to John chapter 6, a lot of this is happening. Because it's hard to believe. How many of us can truly believe that that wafer is truly Jesus Christ? Truly your God, truly your Savior. That whenever you put Him in your mouth, that is the same Jesus that you kneel down and pray to. That is the same Jesus that, that hopefully you're going to ask Him to take you to heaven. That is the same Jesus that died on the cross for you. The same Jesus that bled. The same Jesus that cried. The same Jesus that forgives sins. The same Jesus, the same Jesus, the same Jesus, okay? How many of you guys can believe that? When you walk out of this room, you have to make a decision. Those people who are listening or watching, you have to make a decision, not for me, 
But for you and your relationship, people say, oh, you got to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. This is the most personal you can get with Jesus Christ anytime, any place, anywhere. You cannot get any more personal than believing. That's why Scripture says that Jesus Christ says that you have to believe in the one whom He has sent. Jesus Christ says, you have to believe me. Let's go back and He says over here, in verse 46, Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Amen, amen, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors, they ate the man on the desert, but they still died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat it and not die. One may eat it and not die. He says, I am, I, Jesus Christ, am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. Do you believe that if you eat the body and blood of Jesus Christ that you're going to live forever? How many of you guys believe that? That's what he's saying. If you eat my body and drink my blood, you will live forever. Listen to what Jesus Christ is telling every single one of us. He says, and this is a promise. He's promising us this. He says, And the bread that I will give is my flesh. My flesh for the life of the world. When Jesus Christ died on that cross, He died on that cross. He suffered. He was crucified. It wasn't just a remembrance of Him. It wasn't just a symbolic meaning of Him. It wasn't just a memory of Him that died on the cross. Jesus Christ Himself died on that cross. And that's why He says, I am the bread of life. I came down from heaven. Whoever eats me, I will give my flesh for the life of the world. This is where everything starts changing. The, the Jews, they quarreled among themselves saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So even them, they understood exactly what he was saying. And that's why they said, How can this man... They have not accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord, their God, their Savior, their Redeemer yet. And that's the reason why many Christians who call themselves Christians this day and age, they truly have not received Him yet. They truly have not accepted Jesus Christ yet. They might pray, they might sing, they might worship, they might do all this stuff, but until you believe that that bread is truly the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, you do not truly believe in Him. That's why He says the Jews called among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So even though they were non-believers, they still took it as his flesh. Jesus Christ didn't stop and correct them and say, Hey, that's not what I mean. It's really not my flesh. It's just this, this uh, piece of bread that we're going to be passing around. It's not really me. He never stopped. He never corrected them. And he says, he goes on to say, When they said this, how can, and you know that every word in Scripture you read, when, 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 when they're murmuring, when they're whispering things, when they're thinking things, Jesus Christ knows everything, and He always corrects them, and He always says something. Huh? The Jews quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus says to them, Amen, Amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you do not have life within you. You do not have life within you. He says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Promise. And I will raise him on the last day. He says, for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I have life because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me, the one who gnaws on me, the one who chews on me, will have life because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Unlike your ancestors who ate and still died, I know that they were given the manna because I was there. They ate the manna, but they still died. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. These things he said while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. 
I'm going to come back to the promises in a minute. Let's continue reading this. He says, The words of eternal life, verse 60. Then many of his disciples who were listening said, This saying is hard. Who can accept it? So remember this, you guys. These guys had just seen Jesus walking in the water. They were just they probably ate of the multiplication of the loaves. They just saw that over 5,000 people were fed with a couple of uh, bread and a couple of fish. They seen Jesus Christ raise the dead. They know that his, his apostles, his early church, had the power to, to uh, raise the dead and to cure all these different diseases and different illnesses. So they seen all this. That's why they're called disciples because all these people started believing and started following. But when he got over here to John chapter 6, everything started changing. It says, Then many of his disciples said, This saying is hard. Who can accept it? And again, remember, Jesus Christ knows everything. He listens to everything. He reads the minds. He says, Since Jesus knew that his disciples were murmuring about this, he says to them, Does this shock you? He didn't say, No, 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 no. Let me clear it up, you guys. Let me explain it to you. You know, this is the English version, and I, I used to speak in Aramaic, and this is the true meaning of it, and blah, blah, blah. He doesn't go down that road. He's very crystal clear what he says, and this is what he says. Does this shock you? What if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? Meaning, what if you were to see me floating up on a cloud or by myself and going back to where I came from? Will that make you believe? You obviously don't believe me right now, even though you saw me raise the dead. You saw me doing the multiplication of the loaves several times. You see me raise the dead. You see me cure the blind, the paralyzed. You see me giving power and authority to my apostles to do the same. And yet you still don't believe me? He says, It is the Spirit that gives life while the flesh is no avail. That's why I tell you guys all the time, brothers and sisters, that we must be those spiritual thinkers, spiritual believers. Let the anointing of the Holy Spirit enlighten us. Let the Word of God be the Word of God. I'm not talking about the written Word. I'm talking about the spoken Word. If Jesus Christ says it, that's it. That's final. We either believe Him or we don't believe Him. He goes up to say, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some of you who do not believe. Jesus knew from the beginning the ones who would not believe and the one who would betray him. And he said, For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by my Father. What was the reason why Jesus Christ came down to earth? To save us. To save some of us? All of us. Are you sure? Everybody, right? Yeah. He didn't come just for a select few, right? He came down to save all of humanity, right? Okay. So if a person didn't understand something, or if it wasn't clear, do you believe that Jesus Christ would, would, would let that person go back and, and be astray and go back to his, his, his bad uh, life that he used to live? Or do you think that he would correct it and explain it so they would understand he would correct it, right? He would make sure. That's why Jesus Christ says later on, which one of you would not leave the 99 that are okay and go and find that one that's a stream, bring them back to the flock, right? right? So he came for every single person in the whole entire world, right? So here in this John, he says, as a John verse 6, chapter 6, verse 66. As a result of this, many of his disciples returned to their former way of life and no longer followed Jesus. All because of this teaching. They no longer followed Jesus Christ because he said, Unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no life within you. So, all of a sudden, these people who saw Jesus raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, drive out demons, Multiply thousands and thousands of thousands of such a little. 
And all of a sudden, they're going back to their former ways. They don't want to follow him no more. This is too hard for them to understand. They could not eat Jesus Christ. They could not eat his body, drink his blood. They could not understand this. And Jesus Christ is not changing the explanation. So they go back to their former way of life. Jesus then turns to his twelve apostles and says, Do you also want to leave? Simon Peter answered him, Master, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe, and we are convinced that you are the Holy One of God. That's what we need to say. Yes, it's hard to believe, but it's not against, it's above our reasoning, but it's not against our reasoning. If Jesus Christ says that this is truly my body and truly my blood, we have to say, okay, Lord, if you say that it's truly your body and truly your, truly your blood, I'm going to go ahead and accept it, and this is the way I'm going to live. And one day when I meet up with you and then we hug each other, then you can explain it to me. Then, because no man on the earth can truly explain it unless they've been taught by God. And the only ones that have been taught by God is the church that Jesus Christ established. So you tell me that if none of them understood this correctly, Jesus Christ would have explained it to them. But he didn't explain it to them. Because when Jesus Christ says, Amen, Amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life within you. Unless you eat the bread and drink my blood, you will not have eternal life. I will not remain in you, and you will not remain in me. This is what Jesus Christ says. He says, here's the promises, you guys. Here's the promises that I talked about at the beginning of the class. He says, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no life within you. So if we eat his body and drink his blood, Amen, amen, amen. We have life within us. We have His life within us. We have eternal life. We have the truth. We have everything in us because we consume Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity. First promise. Then He goes on to say, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has what? Eternal life, right? The second one is eternal life. So if we eat his body and drink his blood, he promises us that we'll have eternal life. And I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink, he says in verse 56. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood, remains in me, and I in him. So Jesus Christ himself says that if we eat his body and we drink his blood, that he remains in us and that we remain in him. Just as the living Father has sent me and I have life because of him, so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven Unlike your ancestors who ate and still died, whoever eats his bread will live forever. So all these promises all the way down, you know, from verse 51. And he says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats his bread will live forever. So that's a promise of Jesus Christ that if we eat his body and we drink his blood, we will live forever. And, and I will give, and the, the, the life that I give is my flesh for the life of the world. So all these, if you go back and you read John chapter 6, from I would say verse 46 down all the way, you can count all those promises that he says, that he says, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you do not have life within you. He says, if you eat my body and drink my blood, I will live in you. I will be with you. You will have life within you. He says, if you eat my body and you drink my blood, I will remain in you and you will reign in me. If you eat my body and you drink my blood, I will raise you on the last day. If you eat my body and you drink my blood, I will give you eternal life. These are the promises 
made by Jesus Christ for all who, all who truly, truly believe in Jesus Christ. These promises are not going to be given to anybody who believes a little bit or, or believes here or believes there. This is for that true believer who believes in the one that the Father has sent. If you truly believe in Jesus Christ, if you truly believe that this is His body, blood, soul, and divinity, He will raise you on the last day. He will remain in you and you in Him. He will give you eternal life. And He will raise you on the last day. These are the promises coming from Jesus Christ Himself to all believers. That's why I said it's not just easy as saying, yes, I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Or yes, all I have to do is confess with my mouth and believe in my, in my heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God raised Him from the dead. It's not just that. A person has to believe everything about Jesus. A person has to believe that He came down from heaven. A person has to believe that He established the church. A person has to believe in all, in all the teachings of Jesus Christ, all the teachings of the church. To become a believer of Jesus Christ is so beautiful and so awesome that whenever you read these scriptures and people say, why do you go to Mass? I go to Mass because Jesus Christ told me that He will remain in me and I in Him, that He will raise me on the last day, that He will give me eternal life, that He will hug me and tell me that He loves me at the end of my life because I believed in Him and I would not go back to my former ways of life like the other disciples did when they stopped believing. Yes, this teaching is hard, but not just this teaching. There's many teachings that we've gone over that are hard, but they're not above our reasoning. They're not against our reasoning. They're just a place in our lives that we have to increase our faith, that we have to increase our belief in Jesus Christ, that we have to increase our faith and our belief in, in, belief in the church that Jesus Christ established. Because if we don't start growing in our faith, what are we going to believe? Who are we going to believe? You know, these teachings are so awesome and so incredible that I wish and I pray that you guys have the opportunity to go back and read John chapter 6 and, and listen to Jesus Christ telling you that unless you eat my body and drink my blood, my body, my blood, you do not have life within you. Unless you eat my body and drink my blood, I cannot give you eternal life. I cannot raise you on the last day. He says, my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me. I in him. I will raise him on the last day. I will give him eternal life and you will have life within you right now. This is so beautiful, you guys. I hope and I pray that you guys, the next time you go to Mass, the next time you go to church, that you're thinking about it on the way that you're, you're getting dressed and you're thinking about it and not thinking about the football game, not thinking about the basketball game, not thinking about where you're going for breakfast, not thinking about anything else except for Jesus Christ is telling each and every one of us because what He's telling us is, I love you so much that yes, I laid my life on this cross for all humanity, but I'm giving you a piece of my life. I'm asking you to eat my body and drink my blood so you can remain in me and I in you. That if you eat my body and drink my blood, I will raise you on the last day. If you eat my body and drink my blood, I will be with you forever and you will be with me forever. All these different words, different, different ways to, to accept it, different ways to put it. Go back and read it and accept it and just see yeah, yes, there were many other believers back then that could not believe this, that could not accept this. And it's because it is something that we have to have more faith with. We have to believe more. We have to understand more. The next time that a person takes their kid to communion, first Holy Communion classes, this is what needs to be taught. This is what needs to be spoken. And this is, this is how the children need to grow up believing so as a, as a young kid, when they're receiving their first Holy Communion, that first, that word first, that first Holy Communion is your first encounter with Jesus. It's that, that intimate relationship with Jesus. So they can never, ever forget it. You know, maybe some of us grew up with this teaching. I don't know. Maybe some of us 
uh, fix it up later on, or whatever the situation is. But the whole thing is, is that what we've gone over tonight, what we've read over tonight, now we know, now we know what we're getting out of going to Mass. So I want to close with this teaching, and I just want to ask you guys that, you know, you go back and you read it and you understand it and you share it, because that's what this Bible study group is all about. That's what the Church of Jesus Christ is all about. That's why as Catholics, the, the, the deacons, the catechism teachers, the priests, have always tried to teach us, go get cleansed before you come to communion because you don't want to be held accountable for whatever you have within you. So that's what I want to share with you guys tonight.